<clears throat> All right, so let's carry on. Um, let me get back to where we were. All right, so it's, I think we just started to look at um, triangular arbitrage, which is a very complex topic. So let's go back and revisit it and see if we make sure that we really um, make sure that we really understand what this is all about. So we looked at the supply and demand curves a while further back. Uh, that I think we understand, that's not very difficult. And then we talked about real exchange rates and how they're different from nominal exchange rates because the real exchange rate represents how much of one country's goods and services is required to acquire uh, another country's goods and services. So uh, a lot of economists feel that it's a more meaningful measure than the actual exchange rate that we observe in the marketplace. Then we got into some interesting territory. That territory would be the discussion about arbitrage. And so arbitrage is a process that can arise when financial markets are inefficient, when it becomes possible to buy an asset that's relatively underpriced and then simultaneously sell a relatively overpriced asset and therefore put money in our pockets without uh, investing any of our own money or taking any risk. In principle, that shouldn't ever happen, but occasionally, you know, even financial markets are not perfect. And so this could occasionally happen. Although, as I think we discussed last time, um, most likely these days, arbitrage opportunities will arise for extremely short period. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> extremely short periods of time. And when they do, um, they go by so fast that realistically only computers can take advantage of them. So a lot of these so-called hedge funds do have computers set up to search through financial data in real time and look for these opportunities. And then when they find them to go ahead and, and exploit them by buying something that's too cheap and selling something that's too expensive. And this can work fairly well up to a point. The problem is it's very hard to find these opportunities. Um, as time elapses, markets become more and more efficient. And so these opportunities slowly disappear. If markets were perfectly efficient, then arbitrage would be impossible. At this point in time, it's not impossible, but it's very, very hard to find it. Let's put it that way. So as our example, we looked at a case when the exchange rate between the dollar and the pound is $2 per pound. And we found that the price of gold in the United States is $1,600 per ounce, while in the UK, it is four, uh, 700 pounds per ounce. And the question becomes, does that mean that we have an arbitrage opportunity in front of us? And the answer is yes. And here's why, because when you convert the pound price of gold into dollars, you can easily see the price of gold is only $1,400 an ounce in, in, in England versus $1,600 in the United States. So based on what we saw earlier, the strategy that you would employ would be to buy the gold where it's cheaper and sell the gold where it's more expensive. Now, because gold is the same in every country, we don't have to worry about quality differences or anything like that. Um, the only thing that might be a problem is it might be somewhat expensive to ship gold back and forth between the two countries. But even allowing for that, in a case like this, the price difference is $200, which means that if we buy the gold in the UK and send it back to the US and sell it there, we should make a lot of money. All right. So remember, the bottom line is you, and also, especially if it's borrowed money that you're using, if you can borrow $1,400 and buy gold in the UK for $1,400 and then send it back to the US and sell it for $1,600 you're going to make $200 an ounce net of any expenses you might incur. That's a lot, <coughs> a lot of money for one ounce of gold. Hmm. And so when you stop and think about it, what's to stop this trader from not from borrowing, let's say enough money to buy one ounce of gold. What if we tried to do this with a hundred ounces, ounces of gold or a thousand ounces of gold or any number of ounces of gold? The answer is nothing. Okay, so in other words, this is essentially a, a, a way of printing money almost because it's such an easy way to make money. Now, of course, in reality, first of all, this is not likely to happen. But secondly, even if it does, 
it will be corrected very, very quickly because you won't be the only one who notices this. The trader who's able to buy the gold for 1400 and sell it for 1600 um, will make some money, but then soon afterwards, other traders will notice the same thing and they'll start buying the gold in the US and they'll start selling, uh, sorry, in the UK and selling it in the US. Well, so what you say, because in the process of buying all that gold in the UK, that will push up its price. And at the same time, in the process of selling gold in the United States for 1600, that will push the price down. Okay, and of course, fairly quickly, the prices will be equalized in the two countries. Very quickly, as a matter of fact. So the opportunity will disappear very quickly if it arises in the first place. So, but this does represent what we mean by arbitrage profit. Arbitrage again means taking advantage of pricing differentials and using that to put risk-free profits in your pocket. Now, the, we looked at another type of arbitrage, which is unique to the foreign exchange markets, which is called triangular arbitrage. Now, this involves the relationship between exchange rates and cross exchange rates. In other words, if you recall, a cross exchange rate is one that does not involve the dollar. So here's the example we were looking at. We start out by noting that there's a dealer in New York who's giving a quote of $2 per pound, okay? Um, in London, we find another dealer who's offering an exchange rate or a quote between the yen and the pound of 250 yen per pound. And then finally in Tokyo, we find another foreign exchange dealer who's offering 120 yen per dollar. Now you can see just by looking at these three that these are not consistent with each other. Why is that? <clears throat> well, let's remind ourselves how cross exchange rates were determined in the first place. So for example, here, since we're dealing with dollars and pounds and yen, if we started with $2 per pound, And then we multiply this uh, by 120 yen per dollar. <clears throat> what you'll notice is that the dollars cancel each other out. And this means that according to these two exchange rate quotes, there should be 240 yen for each pound. So this is what we would call the implied exchange rate. It's implied by the relationship between the dollar and the pound and the yen and the dollar. So when we see a quote um, in London, we know that something's wrong because we actually have the ability to take two dollars and buy a pound we can then go ahead and um, <clears throat> well we'll describe it when we get to the circles but we have the ability to use these exchange rates to uh, create in effect a synthetic implied or implied exchange rate between the yen and the pound which is different from the one given to us in london so just like before, our job is to buy the currencies where they are too cheap and sell them where they are too expensive. So just like any other form of arbitrage, our job is to buy currencies where they are too cheap. Sell currencies where they are too expensive. Okay, so if we do that, we should make a lot of money. And there really isn't any risk involved, okay, because we're just taking advantage of the quotes that we've been given. The question is how to set it up, okay? That's the challenge. It's not as easy as it sounds because we can screw it up and we could wind up losing money if we do this in the wrong direction. So. Why don't we do this? Let's, and again, we've already seen some of this, but let's assume that there's a trader in New York City, works for one of the major um, 
investment banks and notices that there's an inconsistency in this cross exchange rate being offered by the dealer in London. And says, listen, I'm about to make some money for the bank. And that of course will translate into a big fat bonus for me at the end of the year, I hope. Or else you might just find an investor who's trading for his own account and this is all his own profit. So we'll start with a million dollars and we'll say, listen, why don't we buy pounds? All right, so we've got pounds. Our million dollars is worth 500,000 pounds. What do we do with our 500,000 pounds? We're going to use them to buy yen. Now, this is the interesting part. The quote that we were given in London says that we'll give you 125 yen for every pound that you bring us. That's what that quote actually means. Okay, each pound that you bring to us, we will give you 125 yen. And you can see right there is the source of the profits because they're offering to give us too many yen for each pound that we bring them. So we can say that this quote Again, this incorrect quote um, shows that the dealer is um, offering to sell too many yen for each pound. And so therefore, what are we going to do? Our strategy based on that should be buy pounds, sell um, with dollars, that is, buy yen with pounds. Okay, so in other words, you're using our US dollars to get our hands on pounds, but that's at a normal, a proper exchange rate. This is the key right here. We're using our pounds to buy yen. Why? Because yen are underpriced. Or we can think of it as pounds are overpriced. And that should help us think about which we're buying and which one we're selling. So we're buying the one that's undervalued or underpriced and we're selling the one that's overpriced. And that's what we're doing. Now, if we're in, Amer in the United States, um, we can't do this directly with our dollars. That's why we had to buy pounds first. And once we have our hands on pounds, then we're all set because we can use each pound to buy too many yen. Once this takes place, we're all set because now we can take our yen back to the United States and sell them for dollars. So the next step down here, I'll put it down here, is to buy dollars with yen. So the quotes in parts one and three are correct and that's fine. It's part two where the profits are because there's a mismatch between the price of the yen and the price of the uh, pound. So our opportunity is to trade pounds for yen after first having acquired the pounds for dollars. And then when we're done, we don't want the yen, but we can convert them back into dollars. And that's when we make our profits. Nice. So that's how this thing is set up. This is the basic logic between uh, behind what we're doing. So when we go around the circle or the triangle rather, you'll see that every step of the way we're doing exactly what you're seeing here, but I think it's easier to follow it visually with the triangle. Okay, and of course the triangle is what gives this arbitrage its name. All right, well, let's see. Let's go look at the graph. Now here we've, well, I wrote all over it. 
Um, you know, let me do this. Let me copy this onto a new slide. So we can look at it with fresh eyes. Let's put it that way. So guess what we've done? Exactly what you would have thought. Here we buy pounds with dollars. Now this step by itself doesn't bring us any profits. We're just paying the, the what is what you would consider to be the correct price for the pounds. This is the part right here where we make our money. Buy yen with pounds. Okay, so the dealer here has goofed and they're giving us too many yen for each pound that we bring them. And so we come down here and we have 125 million yen. Now, if the quote was correct, it would have been 240 yen per pound and we would have only had 120 yen, uh, million yen here. And when we brought them back to the US, we would have ended up with a million dollars. Now, <laughs> instead though, 125 million yen is used to buy dollars. So in other words, we've got 125 million yen. The spot exchange rate is 120 yen per dollar. The ratio of these two, 125 million divided by 120 is equal to, and you can double check this on your calculator, 1,041,667. Guess what? We just made some money. We made $41,667 in a matter of seconds because we noticed this inconsistency in the cross exchange rate. And so we can say thank you to this dealer because that profit is basically coming out of the pockets of that dealer. They're the ones who are gonna lose the money that we made. So this is how it's done. now. If the quote was correct, like I said, um, you would have seen as you went through the circle of the triangle that you would have wound up with the same money that you had in the beginning. And that would be a signal that this cross exchange rate is consistent with the other two quotes. Okay, if this doesn't make any money. That means this must be correct. If it makes money, that means we're, it not only is incorrect, but we have found a way to exploit this. If we lose money, it means this quote is incorrect, but we've gone the wrong direction. So in other words, I have a diagram here where you can see that if I started in the US and I bought pounds, uh, sorry, yen going this direction, I would have ended up losing money. Okay, so let's take a look at that case. If, if let's say uh, this is my first day in the job and I'm trying to take advantage of triangular arbitrage, but I'm not that sure how this works. Suppose I'd used my million dollars to buy yen. I would have gotten 120 million yen. And now this is actually working to my disadvantage because um, each yen is not, um, is worth fewer pounds than it should be. And if this number was correct. So what I'm essentially doing is reversing what I should be doing. Um, in other words, I'm buying something that's too expensive, by which I mean pounds, and I'm selling something which is too cheap. So I'm doing the opposite of what I should be doing. And you'll see right away, look at this, I've only got 480,000 uh, pounds, and at that exchange rate of $2 per pound, oh no, look what happened. I've only got $960,000. I blew it because I've lost $40,000. Oh no. So, you know, I either won't get a bonus this year or I might get fired because I screwed it up. I went the wrong direction. Okay, so this is how all triangular arbitrages work. Again, it refers specifically to the relationship between spot exchange rates here and this cross exchange rate between the yen and the uh, and the pound. If it's not consistent, that opens the door for arbitrage opportunities, but we have to take the correct steps in order to exploit it.
All right. Now, I did mention last time there's another type of arbitrage that we're going to be looking at. Um, let's see. Now, oh, I did want to mention too that it doesn't matter which currency we start with. If we do this correctly, we'll still end up making profits. For example, what if it wasn't an American trader who noticed this, um, but a British trader? The key detail here is that if the British trader does the same thing and moves around in a clockwise direction, then he will make profits too. It's just that they will be denominated in pounds instead of dollars. So imagine this British trader says, oh, look what's going on here. I see an arbitrage opportunity. And he takes 500,000 pounds, takes them to Japan and sells them for 125 million yen. Okay, well, this is where the money's coming from right there. I'm being offered 20 yen for each pound. And that's why I've got so many yen. And when I convert them to dollars, I've got $1,041,667,000. And when I convert those back to pounds at $2 each, you'll notice I've made some money, 20,833.50, which is almost exactly, now remember the dollar profit was 41,667. So here, if I convert those pounds, yeah, 41,667. So notice what happens here. If I convert these into dollars at $2 a pound, that arbitrage profit of 20,833.5 becomes $41,667. So it's the same thing. It has to be. Okay. It's a profit any way you look at it. And then finally, if a trader in Tokyo had noticed this problem, again, the same thing. The trader in Tokyo, let's say, decides to start with 125 million yen. They know, this trader knows that the goal, oh yes, go ahead. Um, actually, I wanted, what's, I think you changed the slide. I was, I wanted to, Oh, oh, all right, let's go back. Yes, this one you mean. Yeah, so we're starting in pounds, right? Yes. Okay, and how, I'm just, I guess I'm not sure how we get um, to 20,833 pounds. Oh, oh, that part, at that part, yeah, at the very end, I just subtracted, uh, I took 520,000. Oh, okay, I see. That's all it is. This okay. isn't part of the process. This is just me at the end saying, woohoo, look how much money I made. Yeah, that's literally all that that is. And, and, and so when we start out with- Okay, out, so in other words, that's how I figured out how much money I actually made. Okay, but starting out with pounds, then we get to yen at 250. What's like, Correct. so I guess I'm confused about how we get to 250. Like, oh, all right, how, watch this. So 500,000 pounds multiplied by 250 yen per pound. These cancel out. If you took out your calculator and you multiplied 500,000 by 250, you would end up with 125 million yen. Gotcha, okay, thank you. So now in some of these cases we're multiplying and some of these we're dividing to get Yen back to dollars, we're dividing 125 million yen divided by 120 yen per dollar. The yen cancel out and we're left with 1,041,667. That's where this comes from. Okay. And then here, this one is pretty straightforward because all you're doing is you're taking 1,041,667 .6 and dividing it by $2 per pound. Thank you. And if you're not you. sure whether to multiply or divide, just make sure that the units you don't want cancel out and that the, you're left with the ones you do want. All right. Okay. Very good. All right. So, yes. Yeah, so let's look at the case where we started in Japan with 125 million yen. It's the same exact logic. We want to make sure that somewhere along the way we are trading pounds for yen. 
So here we have to first go through dollars to get to the uh, pounds. And then of course we can exploit this bad quote by using our pounds to buy um, yen. And we end up with a profit in yen of about 5208 one, uh, 375. If you took that number and divided by the um, spot exchange rate, in other words, 120 yen per dollar, it comes out to almost exactly the same, not, not quite, but exactly very close to the same number of dollars we had earlier. Very good. Now, another type of arbitrage that you might run into in the foreign exchange markets is something very interesting. Uh, it turns out, now we did introduce somewhere along the way, this notion of a forward exchange rate. And we're gonna see that again here. What exactly is a forward exchange rate? Okay, so, well, first of all, a spot exchange rate is the rate at which one currency can be exchanged for another um, when delivery takes place immediately. So in other words, imagine yourself being in, you're in the airport and you're getting on the flight to London and you realize you don't have any pounds in your pocket. You go over to the dealer and you say, listen, could you please sell me a hundred pounds? The price that they quote you is a spot exchange rate because they're going to hand you the, the pounds right away. On the other hand, when you don't need the currency right away, a forward exchange rate is the rate at which one currency can be exchanged for another with uh, delivery taking place in the future. Now, the future typically doesn't mean 10 years, let's say. It means normally, let's say, anywhere from 30 to 180 days is pretty normal. Although it could go out further if necessary. So standard maturities are 30, 60, 90, and 180 days, but it can apply to any maturity that we choose. And the key detail is that you're paying for something that won't be delivered until the future. The purpose of this is to lock in the exchange rate, which you can buy or sell in the future to eliminate foreign exchange risk, okay? Now, I don't know if we can find this on the internet. I'm gonna see if I can find some quotes for this. Uh, the Wall Street Journal used to do this. I don't know if they still do. Hold on one second. Um, quotes, I'll look for quotes for spot and forward exchange rates. How about that? See if we've got, um, no, this is an explanation as to what they are. Let's go back. I was kind of hoping. Ooh. Yeah, um, let's see if I mention the Wall Street Journal. That might help. I'd like you to get a feel for what these numbers look like, but it may not be possible because these are private transactions. Oh, maybe we've got it. Let's see. Um, see, these are spot exchange rates. I don't, for whatever reason, they used to publish forward exchange rates all the time. I don't know why they stopped doing that. Yeah. One good thing about this though, is that you can see the direct and um, indirect exchange rates here. For example, it says here that it takes 0.049 Mexican pesos to buy a US dollar, just under a nickel. Over here though, it tells us that it takes about, a dollar can buy uh, 20.3996 pesos. For some currencies, one of these quotes is probably more convenient than the other. Like the Japanese yen, for example, um, you can see, if I can find it, here it is. A, a single yen costs less than a penny. That's $0.00919. It's just, it's like 0.9 cents. But over here, you can see each uh, takes 108.84 yen to buy a dollar. 
which I think you'll agree is easier to visualize than this. So for certain currencies, we tend to see the direct quote. For others, we tend to see the indirect quote, um, like dollars and pounds, for example. It tends to be quoted as so many dollars per pound. And that's, that's for traditional reasons. It, it, it was always done that way. And probably that will never change, where are we? Here it is, way down at the bottom. It takes $1.39.63 to buy a single British pound. But if you needed to know the opposite over here, that means um, it takes 0 0.7162 pounds to buy a single US dollar. Okay, the pound has always been more expensive than the dollar, it's just always, but in the past, it's typically been even more expensive. In fact, there was a point in history where it took almost five pounds, uh, sorry, five dollars to buy a pound. So it changes over time. But you know what, these are still all spot exchange rates. I was kind of hoping to find um, some forward exchange rates. And you got all these other ones like the Russian ruble, uh, some of these other former communist countries here. You've got some of the Scandinavians. This is the Euro, by the way. It takes a dollar nineteen point eighty two to buy a single Euro. That's usually how you see that one quoted. So many dollars per Euro. What else do we have here that might be fun to look at? While we're here, the Chinese currency, uh, that one is interesting. We're gonna discuss this later on in the course. The Chinese currency is actually not a free floating exchange rate. It is fixed by the Central Bank of China. They, they intervene in foreign exchange markets to ensure that the strength of their currency is more or less the same every single day. They have what's called a fixed exchange rate. And for some countries, that makes a lot of sense. Hong Kong is actually the same way. Um, it takes seven point, roughly 7.7657 Hong Kong dollars to buy one US dollar. And that hasn't changed for quite a few years. They've kept it there. And the idea here is that by doing that, um, the, the currency is very stable. And that means people who trade with Hong Kong don't have to worry about foreign exchange risk. And of course, Hong Kong depends very heavily on trade for its um, you know economy. It, the economy is mainly based on trade. So whatever they can do to keep people buying their products, they're going to do it. All right, but unfortunately, I'm not seeing any forward exchange rates. Uh, let's look at maybe another page. Maybe we can find them. Yeah. No, well, they, oh, they have cross exchange rates here too. Like for example, um, it takes 129.85 yen to buy a euro. It takes 1.1688 pounds, uh, euros to buy a pound, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see they have these, but for some reason, they don't seem to have forward exchange rates. I don't know why. They always used to. I don't know what their problem is. Interestingly enough, they, they now have their own page for uh, cryptos, cryptocurrencies. Look at them all. Look at that. There's a, actually a separate Bitcoin for the dollar and for the euro. I had no idea. Very interesting. How do you like that? And then we got all these other ones that nobody's ever heard of. Like... Ripple, can you imagine the coin is called Ripple? Wow, interesting. All right, anyway, let me see. Let me make one more effort to find some forward exchange rates if I can. Man, this is frustrating. The thing is that this is not proprietary information. This is coming directly from the markets and um, Oh, here we go. How, where can I find? Oh, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Look at that. Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, I guess we're out of luck. Oh, wait, no, 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 look. I don't know when this, all right. Well, okay. I mean, some, this is obviously from an exam, but this is what it would look like. So this is the Swiss franc. According to this chart, if it, it takes 82.15 US cents to buy a Swiss franc, and then if you want to take delivery in 30 days, that price goes up to 85.30. For 90 days, it goes up to 85.53. And for 180 days, it goes up to 86 cents. So this would be a typical example of forward exchange rates. Okay, typically they either increase as we go further out to the future or else they decrease. Sometimes it's a mixed bag, but normally it goes one way or the other. And we're going to see in a few minutes that this relationship ultimately depends on interest rates in the two countries. So, um, you know what, I wonder if, yeah. All right, let's get back to the notes. I was, I was wondering if there's anything else we could find here that could be useful. But um, all right, so what is the exact relationship between forward and spot exchange rates? Well, the relationship we're about to look at is known in economics as interest rate parity. Whenever you see the word parity, it means that there's a, a balance of some kind between two factors. So this one is the mathematical relationship that holds between forward and spot exchange rates. Now, we sometimes call this a no arbitrage relationship because if it is violated, that would provide traders with an opportunity to earn arbitrage profits. So when, when we say that, in other words, if you get a quote from somebody that does is not consistent with interest rate parity, well, then you're off to the races. You can find yourself arbitrage opportunities. So, the question is, how would we do this? First of all, how would we even recognize an opportunity like that if we saw it? And secondly, what would we do about it? So this one is maybe even a little bit messier than triangular arbitrage because it involves four rather than three transactions. But once you get the hang of it, you'll see that it's really not that difficult because ultimately what you're doing is you're borrowing money in one currency and you're lending money in the other currency. I mean, that's really all that you're doing. Borrowing in one, lending in the other. I mean, it's more involved in that, but that's the logic behind what we're about to do. And of course, we have to make sure we pick the right ones to borrow and lend in. Otherwise, we're going to end up losing a lot of money. All right, so how does this work? Okay, so imagine that we are looking at, now, before we do this though, uh, maybe what we should do is take a step back. We have to introduce this very important idea. Uh, let's see. Hold on one second. Maybe we can find a good video about this. Uh, I think we, maybe we can. I bet we can, let's do this. Um, try, uh, let's see, this one looks exciting. Before we go any further with this, I'd like you to look at this video. I hope it's a good one because I haven't seen it before about what we will call Euro currencies. Mm. Oh boy. Oh my God. All right. Apparently the reviews are bad. Oh no. Oh, this one looks promising. Okay. Um, oh my God, man, these people are harsh. <laughs> Um, okay. 
Man, I'm kind of surprised that we can't find a good one. That's pretty scary. You know, one that's, you know, five minutes, just explain the basic details. What is the Euro currency market? Well, this one is about Euro dollars. I'll tell you what, maybe we'll watch this one with the understanding that this applies to other currencies as well. Okay. So, all right, I've seen this uh, series before. I, this guy is pretty good. So let's watch this one. All right, let's, I'm, let, I'm gonna send you the link. This is a, specifically about Euro dollars, but just keep in mind, this applies to all the other currencies in the market as well, or at least the major ones. So, all right, let me send you this link because without this, what we're about to do doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Okay, let's try this. All right, there it is. Let's take a shot at this. I'm pretty sure you'll like it.
All right, are we done? Okay, now that was kind of interesting. I mean, it, it, and it, it did have something to do with the Cold War. Um, the Soviets were worried that if they kept their dollars in the United States, um, and then they did something that they shouldn't have, the US might nationalize their dollar deposits. Okay, remember now Stalin is in charge at this time. And um, let's just say that um, there was always a possibility he might do something that could annoy the West and end up losing all these deposits. So this was the origin of these markets. Now, of course, pretty quickly, it became clear that this is a very efficient way to save our money, um, especially imagine a multinational corporation. You're an American company who does a lot of business in England, but you know, normally under normal conditions, you would prefer to earn revenues in dollars rather than pounds. And so uh, also, um, you know, because you're a multinational, you might be earning uh, revenues in many different currencies. So it might be convenient to have accounts all over the world that are denominated in different currencies. So you might need to keep both pounds and dollars in the United Kingdom, uh, depending on what kind of revenues and expenses you're encountering. So it's very convenient for um, multinationals and many other organizations. And from the perspective of an investor, as he mentioned in the video, because euro dollar deposits are not subject to domestic banking laws, these deposits typically provide a higher rate of interest than domestic deposits. Okay, so if I'm an American corporation and I have funds sitting in an American bank, the interest rate I will earn would be lower typically than what I could earn in a euro dollar deposit account in London. And so that's another motivation for my keeping my funds in the euro dollar bank rather than the uh, domestic bank. In fact, like he even pointed out, I could actually keep dollars in a Citibank branch in London and they still count as euro dollars because they're in London and therefore Citibank can pay me more interest than I would get if, they pay, if I kept my money in New York City, let's say. So why is all this relevant? Because the interest rates that we'll be looking at in this uh, formula I'm about to introduce to you are euro currency deposit rates. Okay, now one thing you also didn't mention in the video is that in the euro currency markets, interest rates are calculated. Let me just mention this as an aside. In euro currency markets, interest rates are based on what's called 3360 day calendar, or what we, what we also call a day count convention. This means that each month is treated as 30 days, whether it has 30 days or not. And each year is treated as having 360 days. which will account for the formula that we're about to look at. So just keep that in mind. The euro currency markets are based on a 3360 day count convention, which means we treat each month as having 30 days and each year is having 360 days. So that means a six month deposit lasts for exactly six, uh, 0.5 years because that would be 180 out of 360. Okay, so with that information in our uh, back pocket, we're now going to be able to introduce the formula that ties together spot exchange rates with forward exchange rates. And it's through the interest rates paid in the euro currency markets. By the way, just as a fun little aside, you may have noticed um, when he was discussing the other currencies that are available in this market, um, the pound, if you notice, was referred to as euro sterling. Euro sterling deposits are deposits of pounds, of British pounds, held outside of the UK. Why would they call it sterling instead of pounds? Why didn't they, why don't they call them euro pounds? Does anyone know? Are there other currencies that uh, are called pounds as well? That's true, and that's a good point, but it turns out, and we don't realize this from our everyday usage 
but the formal name of the British currency, whether they realize it or not, is the pound sterling. So in other words, when we call it the pound, we're using it more of an informal name. The actual name of that currency is the pound sterling. In fact, let's see if we can find some references to that. Yeah, the pound sterling is the actual formal name of that currency. So that's why they call it Euro sterling. Now, of course, as you can probably tell, the name was taken from a time in its history when pounds were actually silver. Okay, and it says it right here. It's derived from the fact that in the year 775, silver coins known as sterlings were issued by the Saxons. Of 240 of them were made from a single pound of silver. And so that means that, and, and maybe later on you knew that um, the British pound for many, many years was worth 240 pence. And it came from the system where the sterling, uh, sorry, the pounds were actually made from a pound of silver. How do you like that? Now, not only that, but if you notice, they're dating this back to 775. How old is the pound anyway? Well, it's possibly the oldest currency in the world. Okay, we're looking at a minimum of 1200 years here, 1250. And so it is probably the oldest currency in the world. And so the name sterling did originally refer to the fact that it was issued from, or it was based on a pound of silver. Ah, that's interesting, very interesting. And that's the reason why it's called that. But nobody says it anymore. I mean, everyone just says pound, but it's understood that it's pound sterling. You're right though, other countries do use the name pound, but I don't think any of the others call theirs the pound sterling. Um, in fact, why don't we just quickly check what currencies are named, called the pound? All right, so we have, um, oh, these are countries that use the British pound. Oh, now look at this. Um, there are other countries, but they're typically very small countries. Egypt has a, the pound. Um, look at that. It even has a link to the currency. I like that. Um, Falkland Islands has a pound. But of course, Falkland Islands are part of the Great, uh, Great Britain. The Gibraltar is part of Great Britain. Guernsey, these are all parts of, of Great Britain. Lebanon, though, calls their currency the pound. St. Helena, wow. Isn't that the island where Napoleon was kept after Waterloo? I think it is. South Sudan, Sudan, Syria. But that's about it. Oh, and then there had been others. Like Bermuda apparently used to call their currency the pound until they decided to call it the dollar. And that's because it had been a British territory. Of course, in Bahamas, they decided to change it to uh, the dollar. Uh, so there had been others, but I guess a lot of these eventually changed their names. The Irish pound was replaced by the euro, of course. How do you like that? There used to, be, oh man, there used to be a lot of them. But not so much anymore. And of course, in there, you know, the colon the the colonies used pounds as well before we became an independent country. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. Anyway. Oh, and by the way, um, here's another interesting fun fact: because the pound was based on a specific weight of silver, this symbol was taken from. Uh, apparently, this is, comes from the Latin word libra, which, as you know, it says here, well, it says it means pounds, but I think it actually means the scales. Like the, um, the astrological signs, libra is the scales. And so the point of it was that in those days, in order to figure out how much your silver was worth, it had to be weighed. Okay, because, it, you know, it, it wasn't really possible to mint coins that were of standard sizes until, you know, much later. And so instead what they did was they just weighed the coins. So every time you bought something, you had to have your coins weighed to see how much they were worth. 
And so that's why um, this, the, the idea of the weights or the scales came to be associated with the pound. Anyway, enough of that history lesson. Um, let's get back to this. And we'll see this formula is telling us what relationship needs to hold between spot and forward exchange rates in order to avoid arbitrage opportunities. And here it is. Now it looks you know, pretty straightforward, but what exactly is it telling us? Well, first things first, um, I'll tell you what, let's, let's copy this onto the next slide so you can take a look at it. So the F is the end day forward exchange rate. Like I said, it's typically 30, 60, 90, or 180 days, but it could be other things as well. And throughout this chapter, we'll assume that we're looking at the dollar pound exchange rate. Just to keep things simple, E is the, going to be the spot exchange rate. Um, dollars per pound. R is the end day domestic rate. And in this case, that would be the Euro dollar deposit rate. And then R star is the end day foreign rate. And in our example, that would be the Euro sterling deposit rate. Now, these currencies, the interest rates in these currencies uh, are clearly not going to all be the same. In fact, I wonder if it would be possible for us to look them up. Euro currency deposit rates. I wanna see what they look like right now. Um, it may not be possible to find this. Mm, oh boy. Um, I'd love to see what they look like, like, you know, the real world values, but it may not be possible. Oh boy. Let, let's see if the Wall Street Journal has them. You wouldn't think it would be so difficult to find this, would you? Oh, okay. Well, you know what these are? These LIBOR rates, these are the rates that are paid to US dollar deposits in the Euro currency markets. Okay, so these are Euro dollar deposit rates. And um, so for example, if I kept my money in a year, one year Euro dollar deposit account, I could earn a whole 0.28% on my money. Wow, interesting. On the other hand, if I wanted to keep Euro sterling, I could earn, uh, let's see, what are they paying for a year? Even less, 0.15775%. So you notice how they're called um, dollar LIBOR. LIBOR stands for London Interbank Offer Rate. That means these are actually being kept in, in Britain. And um, so you might say, well, how can we have Euro sterling rates in England? but they're being kept at American banks in England. Okay, so in other words, if, if you're a British company and you keep pounds in an American branch in, uh, in the UK, it still counts as Euro sterling. So these are the rates that they're paying right now. All right, pound LIBOR means the rate paid to Euro sterling deposits. This LIBOR rates here, without any other name, LIBOR means US dollars. And so, if you had kept Euro dollars in, in a deposit account for one year, you would be earning about 0.28%. These are of course for the Euro. Euro LIBOR means, oh my God, they're negative. Well, that's surprising. That's very surprising. And then we have Yen, they're also negative. Look at this, they're actually negative. If you put your money in this account, if you put Euro Yen in an account for three months, you're going to get a negative rate of interest. It's just unbelievable. Wow. Are you all just as shocked as I am? 
That's interesting. Now, oh, here we go. <laughs> now, here is a fun side note. It's kind of fun and it's kind of not fun. Um, LIBOR itself is going to be replaced in the near future with another rate of interest. Why? You might, this market has been around since the 50s. Why would they suddenly decide to change this to another rate? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there was a major cheating scandal with banks in London where they tried to manipulate these rates to make money at the expense of their clients. And so it was such a big scandal that everybody agreed in the financial markets that we need to replace LIBOR rates with something else that the banks can't manipulate. So what they're working on now is different alternatives for these LIBOR rates. It won't be much longer though, because before LIBOR completely disappears. Um, in fact, I wonder if we can find a video about the scandal. I think you'd find this interesting. Um, yeah, we don't want uh, it to be too complicated, though. Well, this is The Economist. They're pretty good. Maybe we should check this one out. All right, let, let's see what we can come up with. I hope it's just not too technical. All right, let me send you the link and see... Um, it's the kind of thing you might say, well, what's going on here? Um, you might read this in the Wall Street Journal. You might see it in the news uh, that LIBOR is about to be replaced, but we would like to understand why. All right, let's try this and see what happens. All right, let's check it out.
Okay. Well, that maybe wasn't quite as helpful as I thought it might be to explain what was going on. But the, the point of it was that the banks, the, the LIBOR rate itself is kind of determined in a very unusual way. Um, what would happen is that at the end of the day, um, the British Bankers Association would call up all of the major London banks and ask them for their quote for LIBOR for the day. And then they would basically average them out to come up with a single number, which is the one that you're seeing right here. And so if the individual banks decided to play games and um, report the wrong numbers, that would have thrown these off. And um, it would have helped people on the inside with knowledge of the, that this was happening by making trades that would help them at the expense of um, whoever they were trading with because they knew that this was going on. And so because, you know, the problem is that the way LIBOR is set up is that there really isn't a whole lot we can do to stop this from happening again, except send people to jail. Um, the thinking is that what we should do is replace it with something else, which is entirely under the control of each country's central bank, like the Fed in the United States, and so that's where they're heading, but I'm not sure if they've all agreed among themselves what rates to use instead. It's getting close though. I think um, LIBOR is scheduled to disappear in about a year or so. Um, let me just quickly see if we can find more information about that. Oh boy, they better hurry. Oh my God, uh, the end of this year, like, yeah, well, that's going to be hard. Like they were saying uh, in the video, uh, there are so many financial securities whose value is tied to LIBOR. This is going to be very difficult to replace LIBOR with something else. And, um, oh, my God, I don't even want to think about how much work that's going to be. So, um, anyway, that was just all side details. I just want to mention, though, that the reason why that's relevant here is because we're actually using LIBOR rates in this formula. And the reason for that is because these are considered to be very safe rates of interest, very liquid rates of interest, rates at which I, as an, you know, as a, let's say a corporation could actually borrow and lend at. And so um, in the formula, again, there's really only four or five key details. N is the length of time um, until this, uh, in the maturity of the uh, forward exchange rate. In other words, if it's a 90 day forward exchange rate and is 90, R is the domestic rate, which in our case means the dollar, Euro dollar deposit rate. R star is the foreign rate, which in this case is the Euro sterling deposit rate. E is the current spot exchange rate quoted as dollars per pound. And F is the forward exchange rate quoted as dollars per pound. So first we're gonna look at an example of how to calculate this thing. So suppose that we look in the Wall Street Journal and we see that the 180 day Euro dollar deposit rate is 2.89%, whereas for the US or the dollar, or actually I think I said, said that backwards, the Euro dollar rate is 289 and the Euro sterling rate is 4.7521%. The spot exchange rate is $1.86.93 per pound. So according to the interest rate parity condition, what would we expect the 180-day forward exchange rate to be? All right, so we plug in the numbers and you're going to see that we'll come up with a value. And what could that value be? All right, let's see. So now I've saved you a lot of math here by showing you that if you actually did all these calculations, you'd end up with an exchange rate, a forward exchange rate, of 1.8523 per pound. So according to this um, relationship, if I can get a quote from a dealer that's different from this number, I can earn arbitrage profits. So in other words, this is the only forward exchange rate at which no arbitrage profits are possible in this market. Ah, that's interesting. So then if we do find such a quote, we have to understand how to take advantage of it. So now we're going to look at two cases. What happens 
if the quote that we're given is too high? And what happens if the quote that we're given is too low? Um, so let's see. Now, I do want to show you, sort of give you a taste for where this is going. The forward, I'm uh, sorry, the, the forward exchange rate is not just the one rate at which we can avoid arbitrage. It also has another significant, um, there's another significance to it. So imagine the following situation. Suppose that a large multinational corporation has funds denominated in both dollars and pounds. It wants to invest in either a Euro dollar deposit account or a Euro sterling deposit account. Clearly, the multinational corporation will want to keep the funds, or will want to maximize its rate of return. Now, there's one complication here that we have to think about. Oh, by the way, let's assume that this is a U.S. multinational, a U.S. Oh, sorry, a large U.S. multinational. They do business in a lot of countries. It's an enormous company. Let's say it's General Motors, and they have branches all over the place. They have, you know, manufacturing going on in the United States. They have it in England. They sell to customers all around the world. And they have revenues and expenses that are both denominated in dollars and pounds. But they have some money that they don't need just yet. They, they want to invest it somewhere just to get a little interest. And they have to make a decision. Should we keep our funds in Euro sterling or Euro, Euro dollars? Which one will give us the highest rate of return? Now, here's a very interesting complication as to how we analyze this problem. If the US multinational deposits funds in a Euro sterling account, a Euro dollar deposit account, it will not be exposed to any foreign exchange risk. If it keeps funds or deposits funds in a Euro sterling account, of course, there will be foreign exchange risk, but it can be hedged with a forward contract. Okay, so you can see where this is going now. So the question becomes, where can we earn more interest where can the multinational corporation earn more interest after taking into account the hedging that will be needed to eliminate foreign exchange risks in other words we want a risk-free, more or less, rate of return. All right, so we're going to do this in a step-by-step -step fashion using the numbers that we just were introduced to. Okay, so given these numbers, what would happen if the multinational invests in a Euro dollar deposit account, and what would happen if it invests in a Euro sterling account? All right, so let's just say, given these numbers, that General Motors wants to deposit a million dollars in a Euro dollar account for 180 days. How much will they have at the end of those 180 days? Well, that's a simple question because all they have to do is multiply the million dollars by one plus that rate of interest, which is by the way, an annual rate. And here we will multiply that number by 180 over 360 to remind us 
that this is only 180 days. And because this is a 3360 day market, that means that we're basically keeping our money in this account for exactly one half of a year. So if you pop those numbers into your calculator, you'll see that after 180 days, General Motors will have $1,014,450 in its account. Okay, great. Now, what if we decided to go with Euro Sterling? Now, this is a much more complicated situation because we have to first convert our dollars into sterling or pounds. We then have to deposit them. We have to enter into a forward contract. And then in the future, we have to deliver our, our sterling through the contract and uh, use them to collect dollars. So let's see how that works. Here we go. Wow. Um, we have to convert our dollars into pounds at the spot exchange rate. Those have to be deposited in the Euro Sterling account. And then we have to enter into a forward contract to sell pounds for dollars in 180 days. And so it's a much more complicated situation. Well, let's see how that would work out. First, given the numbers that I showed you earlier, if we convert dollars into pounds, a million dollars will end up being worth 534,959.61 pounds. Now, what do we do with those pounds? In order to earn the British pound rate of interest, we must deposit them in a Euro sterling account for 180 days. And what rate of interest will that bring us? Well, it's going to be the Euro sterling rate, but again, remember this is only for 180 days. So we're actually in effect going to earn half the annual Euro sterling rate of interest. So let's do the math, okay? 180 days we'll earn during that period. The higher British rate of interest, which you notice here, um, in the US we we're all, or in Euro dollars, we we're only getting about 2.89% here it's almost double, well, not almost double, but it's a lot higher. All right, so the amount that we now have in pounds is deposited for 180 days. And we know for certain that in 180 days, we'll have 547,670.52 pounds. Now in 180 days, well, we don't know what the exchange rate will be. This number of pounds could be worth a lot of dollars. It could be worth not so many dollars. We do not want to take any risks. So our strategy is to today enter into a forward contract in which we agree to deliver this many pounds for dollars in 180 days. And the exchange rate, which will apply to this contract is the forward exchange rate that I showed you a few minutes ago 1.8523. Okay, so I enter into the contract and I say, listen, in 180 days, I want to sell this many pounds at the quoted forward exchange rate. And guess what happens? If I do that, look what happens when I multiply the pounds that I will have by this forward exchange rate. Um, does that number look familiar at all? $1,014,450? It should, because this is what I got from my Euro dollar deposit account, $1,014,450. So you know what that means? That in spite of the differences in the interest rates between the two countries, given that I'm hedging my foreign exchange risk with a forward contract, I will wind up with the same rate of return in both currencies. Okay, so in other words, that forward exchange rate that I showed you is the one and only forward exchange rate at which this will happen. At any other price, one currency will become more attractive than the other. Right now, we're completely indifferent between the two. 
And in fact, this gives me an excuse to introduce you to a special diagram that we'll need next time, which shows us how this works. Now look at this thing, look how complicated that is, but it gives us a lot of useful information. Okay, this is just essentially a summary of what we've already done, but how do we interpret it? Well, first of all, we start with a million US dollars for General Motors, either we invest in the Euro dollar market for six months and we end up here or else we bring our dollars to the Euro sterling market after converting them into pounds. And these are the same numbers we had before, by the way. And this 534,959 pounds is invested for 180 days at the Euro sterling rate which will give us this much in 180 days. We've already now, we now agreed to sell them through this forward contract at this forward exchange rate. And if you multiply these together, you'll end up with exactly $1,014,450. So either way, this is what we'll end up with. This is the final resting point of all of this. So whichever currency we decide to invest in, as long as we hedge our foreign exchange risk, we'll end up with the same rate of return in both currencies. So that is the role of this number, to equalize the returns to the two countries. So if F is different than this number, then we could do better in one country than the other. And we'll see that that will lead us to an arbitrage opportunity. Okay, now it's a very complex form of arbitrage. So we don't wanna do it now, that's for sure. But I think at least this way you can see where we're headed with this stuff. So why don't we stop right here before our heads explode. And what we'll do is we'll recuperate during the weekend and next week we'll pick it up right here. All right, so any last minute questions? All right, if not, we can, you can just go home and have a wonderful weekend or, well, you're already home. Um, you can have a wonderful weekend and then I'll see you all again next Monday. Enjoy your weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good right, weekend. See you later. Okay, bye.